Ever wonder what psychologists talk about over coffee? I'm Debbie Sorensen, a clinical psychologist in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, where I specialize in rehab and health psychology and acceptance and commitment therapy. And I'm Diana Hill, a clinical psychologist in CSI in Santa Barbara, California, where I specialize in mindfulness and values-based approaches to therapy. In this podcast, we bring psychology research into practice by discussing topics from psychology with experts in the field and with each other. You'll get a glimpse into the books we read, the research we think is interesting, and the ideas from psychology that we use to thrive in our own lives. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Hi, Debbie. Good morning, Diana. Hi. So you are on the heels of the ACBS um, conference in Denver. How'd it go? Yeah, we had a Rocky Mountain Regional Conference. It was really good. Some great talks. We had some wonderful speakers and saw a lot of people I knew from from our area and some people who are mutual friends of both of ours. It was really so fun. A- and I ACBS is... <laughs> Oh, yeah. Back up. It's the Association of Contextual Behavioral Science. Yes. So super nerdy. <laughs> no, it's our it's our community of ACT it's our community, therapists. Our ACT community. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it was really nice. And Steve Hayes, the big founder of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, came out. Great. A great talk. And actually, some colleagues of mine did a talk on shame, which is really relevant to our um, topic today. So it was cool to hear some some new ideas. Yeah, so, and also an opportunity to practice some social connection with uh, colleagues and friends, um, I'm sure. So, yes, our, our topic today is, is all about social connection. Um, and before, before we get started on that, we also wanted to throw out to our listeners that we want to do an episode on um, answering some of your questions and maybe even getting to know some of you out, you know, listeners out there. And how we're going to do that is encourage you to write um, some questions on uh, into Facebook. Yeah, so you go onto our Facebook page, just type psychologists off the clock on Facebook. And if you, I guess if you join or I don't know if you just like it or what you do, but um, then you can get into our Facebook page and you can just type up a little comment or question or something like that there. And we'd love to hear from people and to hear hear some questions that you have. And if you give us some questions, we'll answer them on the air and hope, uh, not sort of diagnosing your family member questions, but more <laughs> questions you'd want to ask right. a, a psychologist. Maybe we'll do some research not for you. Therapy, not right. therapy. Not therapy. More just like topics that would be of interest. We'd love to hear what people want to know more about. Yeah. Today, we're going to be talking about a really important area of psychology research and and in the field, you kind of see this idea in various contexts all over the place. And that is the idea of social connection. And so today, what we're going to be doing is talking a little bit about why it's really important for humans to have strong social connections, social relationships. And we're also going to talk about the problem with isolation and loneliness. And we're going to talk about some really interesting research related to that. And I just want to also say that we're going to have some tips at the end that um, might be useful for people who are struggling with this area who want to be more socially engaged. Um, So don't despair, because it sounds kind of like a little bit of a downer maybe to talk about loneliness. But if you feel that this is something that you're struggling with or that someone you care about is struggling with, we do have some ideas that might be helpful. Or if you just want to make some more friends. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which is hard to do as an adult it's hard to it's make friends so it's hard. it's set up for you all through college but then when you're an adult it's like you have to pick up on people in the playground or yeah something. It's, it's challenging yeah, yeah. And I agree I mean I think it's it, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do especially if you're in that place where you're feeling isolated so we have some ideas that we hope will be helpful if that if that's the case for any of our listeners great Okay, so we're going to start by talking about why social connection is so important. And the first thing is to just think about is how we human beings, we are just social animals. There's just no doubt about it. We really survived as a species because we formed these cooperative groups. Um, and really, cooperation and social connection are we're were and still are completely necessary for human survival. If you think about yourself, if you were sort of placed outside of your human groups, you know, kind of isolated in the woods or something like that, you'd probably have a pretty tough time. So if you think about it from sort of an evolutionary perspective, think about how physical pain evolved because it keeps us protected from things that are physically dangerous for us. 
So um, basically, if we didn't have any pain sensors, or if we didn't have these reflexes that react to pain, we would not survive because we'd be doing things all the time that are harmful for our bodies. And similarly, fear is a biological system that is important. Fear is necessary to survive because it keeps us from getting ourselves into dangerous situations. So if we didn't have fear, we'd be doing things a lot of times that, um, you know, would not be good for us. And really similarly, if you think about the emotion of loneliness, that's also something that evolved for a reason. And that is because we have loneliness as a way of keeping us engaged in our social groups. And that's because social isolation always has been and still is sort of a biologically dangerous thing for us. Humans have always done better in groups. So what we find if we look at the psychology research over and over again, you if you're paying attention to it, you start to see that strong social relationships and sort of social connectedness is really protective for a number of psychological outcomes. So, you know, related to mental health outcomes, um, just in all kinds of areas, developmental psychology, you know, like child development outcomes. And I was just thinking about past episodes we've done in the podcast. And I was thinking in the episode we did on healthy aging, that's like one of the main indicators of sort of doing well in older age is, is when people are socially connected. Um, they, they sort of age better. Um, and also we talked about resilience a couple of episodes back. Um, and one of the best predictors of having a resilient outcome after like a loss or trauma or some sort of adversity is that you have a network of social connections. So it just matters a whole lot in terms of our, you know, our psychological well-being. And what we've also found is that social connectivity is also associated with physical health outcomes. And I thought this was really interesting. Um, there was a headline recently, actually, Diana, I sent it to you. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when I sent it? And I was like, ooh, mm -hmm. podcast. <laughs> um, but it was a headline in the news. And it said, loneliness is more deadly than obesity. And to me, when I see headlines lines like that, I'm always like, oh, geez, they're just trying to scare people. It sounds really alarmist to me. And so I was like, you know, sort of a little bit of an eye roll. But then I actually looked into the research about why they said that. And there was a meta-analysis by um, Holt Lundstad and a few colleagues. We can post it on our, um, on our show notes. And basically, they showed that quantity and quality of social relationships is actually associated with health outcomes, including vulnerability to disease and death, death, even more so than some of the things that you think of as like a predictor of health. So things like smoking, physical activity, blood pressure, obesity. So there's something to that. Mm -hmm. And I was really surprised when we were planning this episode just to get in the mail, um, ironically, that the American Psychologist, the whole journal this month is dedicated to social connection and the importance of so social connection and our physical health, our mental health, and also the biology behind it. Um, and in, in some of those uh, uh, articles, it states that being socially isolated is associated with 50% greater risk for early death. And it impacts, social isolation impacts not only um, our cardiovascular health, but also our neurological responses to stress. And we're also more likely to engage in health promoting behaviors when we have positive relationships. So you're more likely to do things like um, have higher alcohol con um, consumption and less exercise and eat more fattening foods and more sleep if you are more socially isolated. So social connection is important also for how we make the behaviors that maintain our health. It was also kind of it, sort of the idea of the danger around uh, being alone has to do with how as social animals we carry the, the load for each other in some way. And there's been a ton of research into uh, how social connection moderates our responses to pain. So for example, if one of the kind of classic studies that uh, researchers use to investigate pain is to put your hands in cold water and see how long you can keep your hands in there. And when researchers manipulate the degree to which participants feel understood, like, wow, you know, your feelings are understood or we're here with you while you have your hand in the cold water, you're able to keep your hand in there longer and not experience as much pain. 
Also, if, if they manipulate your social connection, you perceive a hill as less steep if you're climbing a hill. Uh, you also think that um, distances that you're trying to get to are closer. They're not as far away if you feel more social connection. So the way that we perceive pain and, and perceive stress is impacted by the quality of our relationships. Yeah. So it, that's so interesting. It's like protective on all these different levels. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, well, and I was I was just thinking about how in our society, what's like the worst punishment that we do for people who are like, kind of do the worst of the worst deeds is solitary confinement, mm -hmm. right? So that's like how we really punish people who we feel are just not fitting into society. And there's some, I, I'm, I don't know a ton about this, but I've read some a little bit about how basically being in solitary confinement is terrible for people. Like people just, it's just really, really hard for people. And so when people are put in solitary confinement for a long time, it's just sad for me to even think about it because you think here's someone who's already having problems and solitary confinement just, you know, it's terrible for pretty much everybody. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just again, a kind of a testament to how just being within a, a social connection is something that matters so much. Mm -hmm. And so this is especially relevant in today's world. Um, our so social isolation and loneliness rates are basically on the rise. Our society is not really fostering this sort of social connection nowadays. And there's a couple of research things that that I kept coming across. Um, there was a loneliness study by the done by the AARP, which um, they looked at. They gave a survey to adults over the age of 45, which I was a little disturbed that that's the cutoff for adults, <laughs> for older adults by ARP because I'm getting pretty close to that. Get that magazine right? really soon. <laughs> I know, and I'm going to be like, "What? I thought I was 27." Um, anyway, <laughs> but they found that about 42.6 million adults over the age of 45 are estimated to be suffering from chronic loneliness, and that's not just you know occasionally feeling lonely as we all do probably, um, but it's chronic loneliness. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a lot of people in our country. And there was a sociology study where they looked at the, the number of close people with whom one feels comfortable sharing a personal problem. So they said, how many people in your life do you feel you can come to with a personal problem? In 1985, the most frequent was response to that question, so the, like the mode, the modal number was three. And in 2004, it was zero. So that means that about 25% of Americans are saying that they don't feel like they have a single person that they can really confide in, which is it's just sad. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, we've we've both, I think, been pretty passionate about this this issue that, um, you know, maybe a big part of that is related to technology and screen time. There was a study in 2017 in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine um, by Premac and colleagues, which showed that people who spend the most time on social media, so people who are spending like two hours a day or more, had higher odds of perceived social isolation. So the people who were on it less, less than half an hour a day, were more socially connected, and the people, you know, who were on a lot are feeling isolated. And that makes sense, you know, if you think about it both ways, like if you're isolated, you might reach out to your screens, but also the more time you spend on screens, the less time you're spending face-to-face -face connecting with people. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's, that's a problem that's probably more and more getting to be the case. And there's this term that I keep on um, seeing in psychology articles called being alone together, which is the idea that we have more contacts and more than ever, more friends, quote, friends than ever, but, but less connection. So we're feeling alone while we're on the screen with, you know, a ton of, a ton of people. Yeah. So we can have like, you know, 500 or a thousand friends on Facebook, but not have any actual friends that are part of our daily life. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a whole completely different thing. And I have to say, I don't know about you, Diana, but in my clinical practice, I see social isolation sometimes as a big part of the problem that many people are struggling with. So they might come in for something like anxiety or depression or whatever. Um, and they're so socially isolated too. And I don't know, it's sort of a, you know, kind of a cycle, I guess, or like a chicken and egg kind of thing, like which is causing which probably a little both. I think that there's like a feedback loop there. So it's good for us to have social relationships. So if we're isolated and lonely, we can feel kind of depressed about that. Or if we're anxious, 
Um, but then the more we isolate, the more depressed and anxious we get. And the more depressed and anxious we get, the more we tend to isolate. So it's to me, it's a it can be a really big part of the clinical work when people are addressing these problems is to be to, to re-engage socially. And a key component of that um, is really shame, I think, because yeah. oftentimes when people are coming in to at least to my office, they're they're carrying something that they feel is um, probably really difficult to share with others. Probably that's why they're coming to a therapist to share it with a therapist. And there's layers of shame often that surround that and that also contribute to social isolation. And I think that this also relates to social media and the real kind of uh, perfection that is put out on social media that we're you know constantly comparing ourselves to and that inside maybe we have things that we don't feel so good about or feel shameful around that's hard to share that vulnerable um, aspect of ourselves with others and that can contribute to that whole cycle of social isolation as well so and we Absolutely. might need to do an episode on shame at some point because I, I think because so. I feel like that's a that's a that's a key player in in why we keep ourselves isolated from others yeah actually that that I mentioned that talk I went to on shame a couple of days ago, one of the things they said is that when we feel that sort of sense of shame, a lot of times our our response is to hide. Yeah. So we, you know, we hide our shame by isolating. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the biology of social connection and how it relates to and contributes to that the physical health that um, you were talking about earlier. So our human brain devotes a lot of space to social functions, everything from emotion recognition, facial recognition, ability to take the perspective of others and monitor social cues. Our good portions of our brain are, um, are taking in social information. And it's the brain areas that are activated when we're socially connected are actually the same areas that have to do with reward. So for example, the ventral striatum and the septal area and the ventral trigeminal area, uh, those areas are activated. When somebody smiles at us, you see those areas light up. So we receive social information, positive social information, and our reward centers are activated. Our brain, the same brain areas are also activated in response to stress. So when we have uh, stressful social uh, situations, you see the cingulate and the insular cortices also be activated. So social stress, um, or social um, relationships can activate at our reward centers and our stress centers. And what's the link between social connection and health and our physical health has a lot to do with how social connection alters three different systems in our body. So our autonomic nervous system, our endocrine or hormonal system, and our immune system. So I want to talk a little bit about how it alters each of these. And this comes from an article by Uchino and Wei that was published in this month's American Psycho Psychologist that I had talked about. And they reviewed a whole slew of neurochemical factors involved in social relationships and health. So first, autonomic nervous system. I'm going to do a little review because I think it always helps to review this stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This <laughs> Go back is to important. the basics. <laughs> right. Go back to biology in high school. So the autonomic nervous system, you think about that as it's the one that is sort of autom um, automatic. It regulates our body processes, such as our blood pressure and our rate of breathing. And we don't have any conscious effort control over our autonomic nervous system, unless you're like a really serious monk or something and can regulate your heartbeat. <laughs> um, but the autonomic nervous system is divided into these two paths. So you have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, think about S for stimulate. It's what stimulates your body's responses. And um, it's activated when we're in our fight flight mode. And then the parasympathetic nervous system is what inhibit it, inhibits many of your responses. And it's more of what we call the rest and digest mode. Okay. So mm -hmm. when you have social support, it has, it has been found to decrease the activation of that sympathetic nervous system. Um, and how they measure that is that you have lower catecholamines. So you have lower epinephrine and norepinephrine levels in your system when you have strong social support. So that fight, flight, freeze mode is sort of getting downregulated and there's more mm -hmm. room for the rest and digest, or I like to call it the tend and befriend um, mm -hmm. yeah. component. So that's how our autonomic nervous system is impacted. And we, they've also found they had married couples talk about um, like have married couples come in and you talk about a conflict in a lab situation and then they measure um, their cardiovascular activity. And again, you see that 
there's with higher marital quality, with more uh, connection and intimacy, lower levels of that cardiovascular reactivity. So that again, the, sym the sympathetic nervous system is downregulated by that having a good relationship with your partner. So mm -hmm. that is a protector against stress, right? If you if you can be with somebody that you care about and then you're faced by a stressful life event, your system will not react quite as strongly or um, um, as negatively. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense anecdotally when you think about when you get into sort of an argument or, or something like that with somebody, you can feel your body kind of revving up like it feels stressful. It feels stressful. Yeah. Or yeah. you think about if you are stressed, one option is to call a friend and talk about it and yeah. how that actually soothes you. And maybe right. nothing about your stressful situation changes at all. But you feel different about it because you've been able to connect with someone. Absolutely. So it's changing the yeah. physiology of your body. Mm -hmm. There's also that, um, you know, social connection impacts our endocrine function. And in particular, uh, what researchers are looking at is the HPA axis. So the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And that system is what sort of culminates in the release of cortisol. Cortisol is like the big demon now, right? Right. <laughs> my cortisol levels are too high. Um, yeah. I'm spinning in a cup all day long to figure out what my cortisol levels are. So uh, <laughs> cortisol actually, it, it's it's supposed to be there. It's good. It's helpful, but you don't want it to high. You don't want high levels all the time. Um, cortisol is what's associated with uh, problems with chronic stress, and it's it's an important endocrine hormone. It influences a number of things, including our metabolism. Um, how we burn fat and polysis. Um, and it also inhibits the immune system. So it inhibits the immune system because you don't, uh, you actually want to have all your energy and resources um, towards dealing with the stressful event. But over time, if you have long term high levels of cortisol, you're going to have, um, you're going to get a lot of colds. <laughs> you're going to get yeah. sick easy. <laughs> right. We've all had that stressful week and then afterwards gotten sick. And that's in part because our immune system's been inhibited. So Positive relationships um, and intimacy also, intimacy also predict better cortisol profiles. So you're you're going to have lower cortisol levels by having friends, basically, by having good relationships with your partner, good relationships with your family. Um, and then finally, you know, or, or sort of the key factor um, is, or, or is also how this relates to immune function, and that you also have a better immune function with with um, with social connection. And that's, there's a couple of studies that were sort of interesting to me. One was marital satisfaction uh, predicted when you go and get um, a vaccine, you have a stronger antibody reaction to the vaccine if you have more marital satisfaction. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Wow. So interesting. <laughs> yes. Um, and then if you have poor marital relationships, you are slower to heal your wounds. So even hmm. our immune system is impacted. And, uh, and part of this may also have to do with lower inflammation is also associated um, with uh, people who perceive that the relationships are supportive. And um, as we know now, inflammation is associated with everything from diabetes to cardiovascular risk to anxiety and depression like we talked about in previous episodes. And probably, so kind of going, you know, down the line a little bit or um, upstream a little bit is what, what, is, what, what is it that is turning on and off some of these systems? And that's in the article that I read, they were really pointing to one hormone, oxytocin, as being a big player in turning off these three systems of the um, autonomic nervous system, endocrine function, and immune function. So oxytocin is... Um, a, a hormone that is associated with um, bonding and soothing and calm and it has sort of a, a, again sort of wants us to again that time and befriend factor and it's an antagonist to the, the hormone vasopressin which is actually what we see when there's high levels of more aggression so uh, when we have high levels of oxytocin it's sort of like the cuddle hormone yeah, you. I think a lot of people hear about oxytocin in the context of breastfeeding. Yes, and how um, that sort of cuddling with the baby, the 
oxytocin levels yes. sort of increase. And that's where it was first really kind of discovered as oxytocin is when that's what also relates to uh, letdown of breast milk. And mm-hmm. But now they're finding that oxytocin is not just re- released by breastfeeding mothers, but it's also released by fathers and it's released in our partners when we're close to them. So mm-hmm. there's this whole positive feedback loop that happens um, that's the, in, in our relationships that relies on synchronicity of our response. And what researchers are calling it is co-regulation, how we co-regulate each other and we co-regulate each other's hormone profiles. Hmm. So here's an example. So a mother who may be holding her infant and she's looking at her infant. If you are a mother, you know what it feels like to have oxytocin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like you get yeah. this flood of like warm, lovey dovey feelings. And that's why you get up in the middle of the night because it's, it's just, you want to be close to this little thing, right? So you're holding your infant, you're going to release, that's going to release some oxytocin, and then you're going to show more sort of affectionate touch towards your infant and how you hold your infant. Now, if a father is watching that, then the father then has a release in oxytocin, and then they can see how that actually co-regulates, um, the, the how even the father responds in terms of reassuring, soothing sounds to, um, to the baby. They also wow. found that when they had fathers playing with their children and they gave them intranasal spa- um, sprays of oxytocin while they were playing, and when they, or placebo sprays, and the fathers that were given those sprays were um, more likely to be involved in their toddler play and ha- like be, have just closer play with, with their toddler um, compared to the ones that the fathers that received placebo. Can I get some of that spray? Actually, just, you can. Just kidding. They are actually looking at <gasps> really? it, yes, as an intervention. Yes. Oh my gosh, I was joking, but that's just interesting. Spray, spray ourselves, <laughs> right? Or, or go find someone to be close to. And yeah, it's, hold their hand. <laughs> look seems at like a eyes. like yes. a cheat, right? <laughs> yes. So two, so bonded individuals can influence each other's. Um, in each other's biology. And this is also shown in romantic relationships. So they measure oxytocin levels of people that are looking at pictures of their partner. This was really actually a nice study. They're looking at pictures of their partner or looking at someone who's attractive. And when they look at pictures of their partner, they see a release of oxytocin, more release, not compared to the attractive partner. So this is helpful, <laughs> you know, that, yeah. that we actually feel a, a different feeling towards somebody that we love and that it changes our physiology. Mm-hmm. Likewise, when they have partners talk to each other about a positive experience. So tell me about how you uh, first met and they talk and talk about the experience, you see um, increased levels of oxytocin. So oxytocin in turn is sort of maybe the key link that um, is is activated when we have these positive social relationships and then goes on to impact the HPA access and its response to stress. Go, it inhibits um, the uh, the sympathetic nervous system and therefore cortis- and um, or sorry the HPA axis and therefore cortisol release and it is associated with decreased blood pressure and acts on a number of brain areas that also activate the vagus nerve which is sort of a, a nerve that um, also a- activates the parasympathetic nervous system so all of this put together it's probably one of the key players yeah and it just shows how much you know that social connection is in our biology, Absolutely. that these complex systems are all involved in in this. And, and humans are, I think, unique in this way. Yeah. Certainly not the only social creatures, but in some ways we are by far the most mm-hmm. social. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the flip side of social connection, which is sort of loneliness. And what we're talking about here really is more like chronic feelings of loneliness that, that are concerning because I think most people probably feel lonely sometimes, especially at certain points in their life or, you know, just depending what's going on. It is it's sort of a normal human emotion to have sometimes. 
Um, but it's it's more when it's chronic that that we're sort of concerned. Um, feeling lonely doesn't necessarily mean that you're completely isolated. Like I think that people can feel chronically lonely even if they're in a partner relationship, even if they have a large social network and spend a lot of time socializing, um, because it's really more of the internal sense of connectivity. So sort of having some quality relationships that are supportive, that feel connected, that matters more than the quantity. Um, and you know also. It's not that there's anything wrong with spending time alone sometimes. That's not the problem because I think most people, especially if you do tend to have a lot of social interaction, most people enjoy some time to themselves. That can be a nice thing. Um, and it's not just for for introverts or it's not like socially connected people can't also be introverts because, again, you don't have to be the life of the party and gregarious. You don't have to have like a huge social network. It's more just having, you know, a few people who – you feel connected to. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this um, from a book that I read called Loneliness, Human Nature and the Need for Social Connection. Um, and it's by John Cassioppo. He's the director of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience at University of Chicago. So if anyone really wants to get into the science of this, it's actually like a really great book. Um, so a lot of the ideas for this section came from from that book. Um, but he there are three complex factors that he writes about that I want to talk about today. The first is that we have basically we inherit different levels of vulnerability to social disconnection. So we all might have different levels of need for social inclusion. So some people need a lot of social connection to be satisfied. And you might think of these as sort of your classic extroverts who really just need a lot of social connection. It can be really intense. They can have like a lot of people or a lot of time with social, you know, interaction, um, whereas other people need like less of that to feel satisfied. Um, so that seems to be something that is at least somewhat, you know, variable person to person and that's at least partially inherited. Um, so like Diana, you might need more alone time than I do or vice versa. It's really a problem when there's sort of a mismatch between the desired level of social connection and the environment. And you could even think sometimes of a couple where one person is just needs more of that and the other person needs some time to kind of just be alone or to to not be socializing and how sometimes that can be sort of a an issue in a in say a couple relationship where one person is always like, come on, let's go out or let's go do something and be together. And the other person's like, you know, I, it's too much. So, um, so again, you know, there's no like one size fits all model for this. Mm -hmm. um, another part that he writes about in the book, um, he calls it the feedback loop of loneliness and negative affect. And I think this is important. Um, basically, loneliness can basically lead to other emotions like anger, anxiety, et cetera. These emotions that we, we usually consider sort of the, quote, negative emotions. Um, and basically, feelings of isolation are associated with difficulty regulating our emotions. So you said a few minutes ago, we sometimes carry the load for each other. So when people are isolated, they have a hard time coping with these emotions. They maybe aren't able to regulate them as well. And so that can make the loneliness persist. And a lot of times people do things to relieve their emotional discomfort that are actually really not helpful. So things like substance abuse, just more and more isolation, even suicide. So these are, you know, this kind of unhelpful type things can just sort of keep the cycle going. So it's really important to look at that, look at how, um, you know, loneliness might be digging you in deeper with some of these other other emotions. And then finally, the third the third area is basically the relationship between our social perceptions or how we sort of think about social relationships and our social behaviors. So social cognitions are basically how we make sense of social relationships. And what I think is so interesting is that when people are chronically lonely, basically they start to see danger everywhere in their social landscape. So even like something that's actually relatively benign, like someone doesn't say hi to you on the street or something like that can be perceived as a slight. Or we might get really hung up on fear of rejection or assuming that people are thinking negatively of us or, or um, you know, feeling just this sense that the social environment is sort of threatening. So Diana, mm -hmm. let me ask you this. If you had this belief, 
no one likes me. And you really sort of bought into it, but you had plans to go out and do something social. How do you think you might behave if that was, if you were really bought into that belief? Um, I, if I were to go, I would probably go, but sort of skirt around the edges and not fully participate and not put myself out there because no one likes me. Um, right. right. Or, or I would not go. Yeah. Um, because you might even just no one likes skip me. it. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And do you think that that would be really helpful in the long run if you were chronically lonely? No, but yeah, I mean, no, because I would never get disconfirming evidence that, right. that right. someone would like me because I would never actually be able to gather any new learning experience of someone showing that they that there's something to like. Exactly. I would just be feet kind of ruminating in my own belief. Yeah. Yeah. And it sort of makes sense that, that if that's your belief, that that's the way you would act. Like there's some logic to that. But basically what, what can happen is that we can have these sort of negative thoughts about social situations, and then we can get into behaviors that actually elicit rejection from people. And so this can look different. This could be, you know, isolation or becoming sort of guarded and mm-hmm. self-protective, you know, kind of putting that suit of armor on with other people. It could be in people can sometimes end up being like demanding or needing constant reassurance. Mm-hmm. So it can actually look sort of like neediness um, or aloof. People can be sort of blaming others or be really insensitive to other people where they're so focused on themselves and their own fear of rejection that they they're just like not actually engaging with people. Um, So it can look a lot of different ways. But basically what happens is that people can start to do things that push other people away, which basically becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then it confirms your beliefs. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. And I I just thought of an example. Um, I don't know if you ever read these, uh, the original Winnie the Pooh books, Mm -hmm. the AA ones. Mm -hmm. My, My youngest child loves them. And so we read them all the time. And in the original books, the Eeyore character is the perfect example of this. Because in the books, he's like, he's kind of snarky. And he's always sort of negative, And he's kind of always guilt tripping yes. the other characters for like, because they don't, he's not as included because he just hangs out in his little thistle patch and he ignores everyone. So they kind of forget about him. But then when they do come around, he sort of guilt trips them. Yeah. Like, oh, nobody cares. And basically, because of that, he's not like as enjoyable to be around. So then they forget about him more. And so it's kind of sad. Yeah. And it's, kind of cute and humorous in the books but I think that that's sort of an illustration of what can happen but underneath Eeyore is a softy when, if you read the one about the birthday party yes. when, he, when he gets the deflated balloon he's like oh, oh. I always wanted a deflated balloon because underneath all of that all of that lonely depressed Eeyore is just he wants a little bit of love but he doesn't allow anyone in by all that behavior that he's engaging in yeah actually yeah. They what we, love we him. Um, he lets them in they love him a fun thing to do is diagnose all your family members based on the Winnie the Pooh characters <laughs> yeah right. and they which one him. are you <laughs> <laughs> there's the binge eater, the anxious yeah. one. The, yeah, there's the owl that like that goes on and on and on about himself in intellectual ways. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Pedantic, yeah. And yeah. controlling rabbit. Yeah, um, controlling and constantly busy rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We could do a whole episode on this. Yes. Okay. So let's move, though, into our tips. Our tips. Okay. Eight ways so we- to increase our social connectivity, or maybe even just simpler, eight ways to make friends. <laughs> to make friends. Yeah. yeah. And this would be helpful if you or if someone important in your life, like a friend or a family member, or if you're a therapist like us, it could be a client. Um, it was kind of helpful for me to think about this because I might use some of this with my clients. Yeah. So here we go. Tip number one. Okay. Be open and start small. So if you're isolated and you want to build more social connection, just start with finding these simple moments in your daily life where you can have human to human interaction without any expectation. So just try to take a stance of being more open and available to people, show genuine interest in people in small ways. Um, And really showing interest in people is a lot more important than acting interesting. I think sometimes we put this this pressure on ourselves to be this really interesting person, but actually people respond better when you're just interested in them. So um, in that book, Loneliness, I mentioned, Cassiopo writes that you start by feeding others. So instead of focusing on your own social needs, like, oh, I really need to go out and meet a romantic partner or make a new friend, just start by, you know, having a little interaction with other people and, and just be that kind of warm, open person that that socially connected people are. So like, if you go to the library, tell the librarian about a book you just read that you thought was interesting or 
ask the person next to you on the bus a question or talk to a coworker and actually like really listen to what they're saying. And it might be like a two minute interaction, but it's really a small step. And if you don't put a lot of expectation on it, it can just be a way to build this pattern of increasing your, your social connectivity. Great. And then number two is never mind your thoughts. So begin to start to question your social cognitions and probably everyone has um, helpful thinking about social situations now and then. So we all have fear of rejection. We all fear being criticized or getting negative feedback. But what's important is that you're aware of those thoughts and maybe question them or don't take them as fact or don't let them direct your behavior. Because what we actually find is that the more that you believe your thoughts, the more entangled you get in them. Rather than going out and aligning yourself with the type of person that you wanna be in, in social situations, and then maybe also getting some disconfirming evidence, learning new things based on uh, some of your interactions. So the thoughts can, you know, sometimes I, I talk with clients about just sort of packing them in your purse with you and they're going to, they're going to come along for the ride, but then have your hands and legs direct the show in terms of how you're going to move your body and, and going out there um, and maybe being a little bit more uh, vulnerable and at risk um, yeah. than comfortable. Yeah. And that leads to, to tip number three, which is to watch your actions too. So if you're doing that Eeyore type approach, acting in ways that aren't really good for your social relationships, you should take a look at that, you know, kind of noticing are these things, if you're in a, pa a behavior pattern that's not working, you need to start by noticing that and then, you know, be flexible, try a different approach. So, you know, if you're, if you tend to be really guarded around people, or if you tend to be overly critical, try to like, lighten up a little, or if you demand a lot of reassurance, maybe re reassurance, maybe try just not putting that, that desire out loud, keep it to yourself and just change the behavior pattern and see, see how that works. And then number four is find supportive communities. So whether that's going to meetup.com or having, finding a religious or spiritual group or volunteer somewhere, um, find some some groups that may be accepting of you. I also think there's the idea that can be helpful around start your own book or your own group. So Eric Barker, who wrote the book Barking Up the Wrong Tree, he talks about that having a, a group can be particularly helpful because you actually only have to put in, so if you have like a group of five, you only have to put in 20% as much energy. <laughs> yeah. Because you're like killing a bunch of birds with one stone, right? When you meet. The lazy person's <laughs> relationships. <laughs> right? You don't have to talk as much. <laughs> right. And when you see them, you're seeing all five people, you know, so you can have regular, uh, uh, meeting of folks, but you can, you can start your own group around something, you know, and you know, that's how actually Debbie, you and I met was, uh, through a friend and now we have this this group of five psychologists and we meet up you know multiple yep. times a year and we have a group chat and, and it's a way for um, for us to all stay connected but it was definitely self it was formed um, not because of some external source so maybe even think about something like a book clubs or another way um, to stay mm -hmm. people really enjoy that in terms of staying connected with others. Yeah. And our group, I think it's, it's a really nice dynamic of the five of us. It's, it's just, there's something about that group dynamic that's really special. So if you can find that, you know, it's a great thing to, to look for. Mm -hmm. And number five is related to that. Find a super connector. So the same, um, Eric Barker, who wrote the book, Barking Up the Wrong Tree has a blog post where he says to find a person who just knows a lot of other people and who connects them. And so our group of five started because our friend, Meg um, brought five of us together and she was the super connector. And so if you can find someone like that who can bring you together and just expand your social network. Yeah, great. And then number six is, oh yeah, turn off the screens and meet up in person. So, uh, okay, <laughs> did you hear about the, the new McDonald's uh, campaign called the Phone Off Fun On campaign? No. So McDonald's? McDonald's. Interesting. Yes. McDonald's <laughs> has. Who knew? McDonald's really cares about our health. And um, they, <laughs> they are putting in their restaurants a place where parents can lock their children's phones so that they can sit at the table and interact with each other at their family meal. Because everyone has their family meal. 
<laughs> not in yeah. the car, not McDonald's, but, um, but, but actually this idea that we need to turn off our phones to be able to see each other. And there is, um, there is, there is research showing that eye contact is on the decline. We are less, we are making less eye contact with each other. We're less comfortable looking at each other in the face, but also the phone is distracting from, from being with each other. So making eye contact, meeting in person, talking, you know, instead of texting, those also may be important factors in terms of oxytocin release. So just, you could think about it for that. That's important for bonding. Um, even just in eye contact, our pupils dilate and contract uh, based on emotions that we're experiencing. And then the other person receives that information and their pupils dilate and contract. So there's, there's some real benefit from having that face-to-face -face contact with others. Yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't happen on the screen. Mm -mm. Okay. Number seven, get vulnerable. Woo. <laughs> so really to increase connection in your relationships, you need to get past the superficial and into the meaningful. And so whether you have some relationships right now that might be a little disconnected or if you might have, um, you know, be in the process of sort of building new relationships, it's really important to put some effort into this, to carve out some time, to put down any sort of temptation to be distracted or multitasking, um, and really connect, you know, open up, be real and genuine and vulnerable. So go past the superficial. And I'm not talking about being vulnerable by doing a post on social media. I'm talking about really being person to person with people, um, making relationships where you can really care about one another. And I noticed, um, you know, in today's busy world, um, sometimes my family were just like constantly doing. And so we've started this fire pit that we we have. We just got it at, you know, Home Depot. And maybe, I don't know, it's fall right now. So we're doing it pretty frequently, like a couple times a week, we'll build a little fire and we'll just go sit out there and we'll just kind of have some family time or just my husband and I will go out and we'll actually, you know, connect with each other. It takes a little time and effort because sometimes I feel this pull of like, oh, but I should be folding laundry or I should be catching up on some work or something. And so I have to actually like consciously make an effort to, to stop and connect. Mm -hmm. That goes back to our Hugga episode. Yeah, way it back, does. Way yeah. back in time. The and, Danish yeah. practice of cozy connection, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. And I also think vulnerability is what keeps our group of five friends together and because we're all psychologists we just we go straight for the jugular when we meet oh, yeah. <laughs> there is no yeah, superficial right. talk <laughs> it might freak some people out yeah but we love you, it. <laughs> it's like a giant group therapy session uh, yeah. but 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 so we bond really close really quick because we're yeah. because and we we're get so vulnerable yeah. i mean we oh, talk yeah. about some of those yeah 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 Okay, and number eight is keep to the two-week rule. So this also comes from Eric Barker, um, where he recommends keeping contact with friends at least every two weeks. And this is based on information from a study at, from Notre Dame, a physicist and a sociologist. They examined more than 8 million different phone calls between 2 million, two million people, and they found that the le leading cause of relationships that persisted was reciprocity and returning a friend's phone call and in particular touching base with friends at least uh, once every 15 days so keeping that in mind that you need to you need to keep the relationship going making contact and sort of a general rule of thumb is, is making contact with your friends at least once every two weeks which is maybe why I need we, to I need to work on this one. well this is why we yeah. have it built in Debbie because once every two weeks we, right we record a podcast, we record a podcast. so we're yeah. friends for life here uh, actually but it helps it makes I have a to say, I, yeah mm -hmm. I feel a lot closer with you because we do connect frequently yeah it helps yeah. yeah so it needs a little watering once every two weeks water your water your friends absolutely and if you do it in a group you can get a lot done <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Group of five ish. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Diana. This is a really uh, interesting conversation. And I hope that people find it interesting and helpful. Um, and don't forget to get onto our Facebook page and and ask a psychologist. Yes, ask, ask us some questions. questions. We'll read them on the air. Love it. Thank yeah. you for all the work that you did. Debbie did a lot of work in preparing for this episode. So appreciate you in um doing all that work and I look forward to more conversations to come. Likewise. Bye everyone. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and iTunes. You can also find us at www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's off the clock, P-S-Y-C-H.com. 
Music by John Goo and Susie Stevens. <laughs>